<laughs> Lily, okay. we missed you too. Thanks. It's good to see you, Gabe. Okay, how are you? Um, and I believe we have Amaris. There's Amaris. Hi. Hi, Al. How are you? I'm doing well. How Very are you? Good. So you're in our time zone. Dave Poplar, on the other hand, is three hours away. Hey, Dave. Good morning. So I it's uh, 9.04 a.m. Bright and early. That's cool. No. And Joe Massey is there. Hi, Joe. Hey, Al. Hey, everyone. Hey, good morning. Um, we have uh, Jake Marmer, who is going to be joining us with his entire class for a few minutes. Do we know how that's going to happen? We're not really sure. It should be interesting. Um, several other folks said conflicts and uh, are off elsewhere. Erica also had a conflict, but she's going to join us. We have Laura in the room, and we have an amazing portable mic. Is that all you're going to be doing, Nick? Yeah, that's it. OK, cool. Uh, and we have Anna on the phones. Hi, Anna. Hey. Hey. So just a couple of announcements, and we'll get started. Uh, we're going to be talking about week five poems. Um, first announcement is that Kathy D has put together a thread called Awkward at Forums. And this is for people, it's sort of a paradox. If you're awkward at forums, go to this forum and be less awkward. I don't know. Or you can be awkward within that forum. Anyway, Kathy D, one of the CTAs, has kindly put that up. It's, it's really for people who don't quite know what to do with the forums. Um, so I hope you'll check it out. Here are some reminders about meetups. So take notes, because this is great. If you're in the New York City area, Saturday, October 14th, which is this Saturday, Mandana Chaffa, longtime CTA, is uh, hosting a group, another group, at the New York Public Library, the 53rd Street branch. And on my notes, didn't take down the time. I'm so sorry. But if you go to the, th to the discussion forums and you look under study groups and meetups, you can find one of the top threads that is most recently contributed to it will give you the time. That's Saturday, October 14th. Um, Joe Massey, hey, Joe is, is doing a nice thing of putting together a Western Massachusetts Pioneer Valley meetup. Joe, what town is that going to be in? East Hampton. In East Hampton, which is your town, I think. My town, yeah, yeah. right next to Northampton. Um, and so it's about to be our town. It's going to go from my town to our town. Uh, October 21st, which is not this Saturday, but the following at noon at the Shelburne Falls Coffee Roasters in East Hampton, Massachusetts. There's a Chicago meetup that Max is hosting on this coming Saturday, October 14th, from 2 o'clock until 3.30 at the Harold Washington Library, 7th floor. And there is a Los Angeles meetup hosted by Molly uh, at noon on October 22nd, which is Sunday at Bulletproof Coffee in Los Angeles. And this Saturday, the DC Gang, which meets every Saturday at Politics and Prose. Where's the poetry in that title? It's at Politics and Prose. They sneak in and do poetry at Politics and Prose. <laughs> yeah, it's in the ampersand. Good job. Uh, Saturday, October 14th, that's this coming Saturday at 10 AM in Washington, DC. And there are many more meetups happening. That's just New York. Western Mass, Chicago, LA, and DC, but there's a lot going on. Um, for instance, there, has been, there have been several meetups in Tirana, Albania, and uh, forgive me, my friends in Albania, um, I didn't know that Tirana is the main city of Albania, Albania until I looked it up, um, and I have a picture to show you I seem to have deleted it, though. That's really stupid of me. Anyway, I have a sort of a picture I can show. Let's see what Zach can do with a close-up. Zach's very busy. There is a picture. It's a black and white printout. I had a better picture on my iPad, but I seem to have deleted it. There's a gang. Uh, they met recently. In fact, they met the day we were doing a London, our London meetup. And when I posted this to Facebook, Thanks, Zach. When I posted this to Facebook, um, one of the people who uh, is organizing that, her name is uh, Brunilda Cookie, um, says, we're, we're getting together tonight, our time, which means now, which is about, I guess they're about eight hours ahead. So it's 8 PM there to watch the live webcast. So they're here. 
And so we, I'm going to give out the phone number in a minute. We hope that you guys will call us from Albania. I'd love to know what it's like doing your, your meetup there. So uh, phone number today, 484-352-2429. Let me do that again. 484-352-2429, and Anna is standing by. We're tweeting at hashtag Modpo Live. And we have a subforum, and Gabe's been looking at the subforum already. And that subforum is if you go to webcasts, you will see a subforum that's called Post Here Questions and Comments for the October 11th webcast. That's the place to go today, the preferential place to go other than Twitter, because we understand that Facebook is down ish. Is that really possible? Facebook is down, and so if you depend on Facebook for your webcast feed, you're not going to hear this announcement, but you should get the heck out of there and try another feed. And we have Laura here. I already mentioned that. So what we're going to do is start. We'll take your phone calls. And uh, Gabe, we had a question about form from Cindy, and we might as well start. This is giant. This is huge. But it's time for us to talk about form and content. We could have talked about it in week one. I think we did a little bit. But the poems that we're studying today, particularly in chapter three, the communist poems, and especially in chapter four, the Harlem Renaissance poets and those they influence, um, this is a big question. The way form can militate against content, the way form can create an irony. So we have poems that deal with form content. And I'm going to say what they are, and then I'll invite anybody here, uh, or Amaris, Dave, or Joe, just to pick one of those poems and talk about the way in which the form and content is really different. Um, so Ruth Lechlitner's Lines for an Abortionist's Office, there's a classic example of a high churchly ballad uh, being used to contain radical content. Um, in favor of, of a woman's right to choose to terminate a pregnancy uh, at a time when that was illegal. Uh, Genevieve Taggart's interior is maybe a little harder on that question, but the form seems to be conventional lyric subjective, and the content is a hatred of the middle class for staying indoors and not participating in the revolution. Uh, County Cullen's incident and Claude McKay's If We Must Die are classic examples of form and content, form being used really as a strategy uh, for uh, s sort of sneaking in to conventional conversation about race. No. Uh, Hughes's Dinner Guest Me is a good example. And my favorite of this oh, is Gwen, Gwen Brooks, Gwendolyn Brooks' Boy Breaking Glass, where form and content work together. So let's just talk about any of those poems or generally about the whole question of form. Gabe. What, what is this thing about form? Can form actually ha create its own signification separate from semantic meaning? Yeah, definitely. And form has a lot of like tentacles on which to like talk about. Um, there's such a, there's form in the sense of like really traditional idea of a poetic form. So like a ballad is a form. Like a stanza form. And exactly, that's by right. no means all we mean. That no, is a very narrow definition of form. Right. So inside of form, we also mean things like technique, uh, style, the way like words are visually laid out on a page. We can even mean diction, like specific diction word choice. Diction and tone. Yeah. So there's a lot to be kind of looked at there. Such as in the Lech Littner poem, Thrust Deep the Long Curette. Yeah. Right? I mean, you don't, I, I don't, I mean, there's some people in the forums who think that she is against abortion rights, and maybe we should talk about that. M most people will read that poem and say she's obviously against limitations, the illegality of abortion. So if you follow that, mm -hmm. that line is ironic. Yeah. But the, even the. Or it's a go ahead, make my day kind of. Resistance. Yeah, and when we talk about like form with that line, we also want to talk about the like inverted syntax there, which was not like traditional English or even the English of the 1930s. Thrust deep the long curette. You can say, you know, thrust the long curette deep. You can say not call it a curette. You can call it a lot of different things. So there's so many little pieces. And that's diction. So high high diction, mm -hmm. archaic diction, mm -hmm. tell, gives you a hint that there's an irony. And yes, that's formal exactly. irony. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lily, can you contribute to the question about form? Want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think um, 
uh, well, just thinking about the term irony, like irony doesn't have to necessarily mean, um, sarcasm, uh, right. Uh, or like funny irony. It can just be like a, um, just, it's hard to think of what a better word than irony would be, but just like signification made on, uh, level different than just the content of what's being said um so yeah, I, yeah a gap i mean the way irony got used when literary theory had its heyday during deconstruction irony was any difference yeah any difference between the semantic meaning of a word and what it actually means given the full context of form yeah okay joe do you want to take a crack at this giant question how do, why do we talk about form especially in context of these radical poems, poems with radical content that deliberately use conservative forms. They're creating some meaning in doing so. Yeah, uh, well, I'm looking at the County Cullen, uh, Yet Do I Marvel poem. Yeah, and I which guess is a this sonnet. Is a, yeah, I'm a sonnet, right. Yeah, and I'm not a formal guy, but I, I guess it is an iambic pentameter. Yeah, And yeah. the regular meter and rhyme scheme, it becomes a conduit for for meaning and almost becomes hypnotic so that the message is driven in even further, even deeper. Um, you kind of get swept up in it. So form becomes this uh, perfect vessel for uh, difficult subject matter. Yeah, that's very well put. Um, Anna, do we have a call? We do. We have our dear pal Mandana calling. Ah, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, can you bring her up? Chris, is it this one? Mandana? Sorry, I'm on sec. Okay. Oh, that one. Okay, try now. Hi, Mandana. Hi, Al. Hi, everyone. Hi. We're going to bring your volume up a little bit here in the room. Hold okay. on. Okay, try again. No. Hello. No one's ever really wanted to bring my volume up, so that's pretty <laughs> exciting. You're, you're, yeah, okay. I'm not going to touch that comment with a 10-foot <laughs> pole. <laughs> How are you? When are you going to... When are you going to come, a, come to Philly? Hopefully in a few weeks uh, I'll, I'll be down there for one of your webcasts. Good. And I believe uh, I didn't give the time of the New York meetup because I didn't write it down. Can you tell us what the time is of the October 14th meetup? It's, it's at noon, and if you've mastered teleportation, you can do uh, both Max and I uh, on the 14th and uh, then scoot over the following week into Los Angeles and East Hampton while you're at it. Yeah, okay. I think someone should try to get it to all four of those. That's cool. <laughs> um, so I was listening to what you were saying, and one of the things that I wanted to bring up, you kind of addressed, but maybe you don't mind me bringing it up in a different way. Um, you know, I'm always fascinated by the way you structured week after week after week. There's a, there's a real through line that, that goes through. Um, Last week, deconstructed what we consider language and the role of meaning in poetry. And this week, which you know is a favorite of mine, appears to return to meaning making in a very serious way that um, is certainly resonant, especially in our current context. But I don't think of it as a few steps back in modernism, uh, perhaps just a switch back, a way forward into what's more contemporary now. I have my own reasons why, but I'm really curious what you all think about that. All right. What a great question. Will you stay on the line for a couple of minutes? Sure. Okay. All right. Amaris and Dave, I'm going to ask you both to follow up what I say to this, because the, the, you, among others, have been with ModPo for six years now, and, and week five, which is a very exciting week, gives us some perspective on the rise of modernism coming right after Stein. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how week five has sort of resonated with you for the, over the years. Um, uh, my answer to Mandana's question, I do believe that Frost takes a step back from modernism. I do believe that he is nostalgic for subject-object relations. I do believe that he really likes the idea that there's somebody on the other side of the wall who's not him, so he can kind of tear him apart a little bit. Um, or just do the custom of humanity with him once a year walking the line. What's so great about Frost is that he's aware that he's making that conservative move, totally aware. And that poem is kind of a meta poem if you read it a certain way. I think Wilbur and Kennedy are both taking a big step back. That's chapter six. So chapters five and six are, I believe, retreats from modernism. 
uh, in, in the case of Frost for both social and political and also aesthetic conservatism, which is very smart, but I think uh, steps back. Wilbur and Kennedy are complicated, but I think that Kennedy is in particular angry at the way modernists kind of flaunted their multi-perspectivalism. And so he creates what might be called a neo-Augustine, you know, pre-modern uh, uh, rejoinder to new descending a staircase. Uh, the communists are complicated because they felt, they all were steeped in modernism, but they felt they needed to use traditional forms in order to appeal to the masses, quote unquote. Appeal is in quotes and the masses in, is in quotes. <laughs> But Ruth Lechlitner, who was a member of the Communist Party of the United States, I al almost alone know that because I've seen her party card, but she kind of hid as a liberal. Um, lines for an abortionist office is using high churchly ballad in order to sneak in to readers who were reading ballads, especially Catholics. Um, and, or I would say religious Christians. Uh, and Genevieve Taggart is using the modern subjective lyric in order to say something just sort of dogmatically rather plain about what's wrong with the middle class in the middle of the Depression. So I think there's some steps back, and you would sum the summary of Lechlitner and T Taggart's problem, which we talked about in our original videos, is that you're doing radical content but using traditional form, radical content conservative form. And that means there's an irony created, as Lillian Gabe pointed out. But the question is, does the, does the radical content get sort of hidden or, hidden or softened by that? The Harlem Renaissance poets, I totally agree with you. This is a furthering of modernism. This is a furthering of modernism. And it's not meant to suggest that, I mean, they're definitely calling out modernists, especially white modernists like Stein, for breaking things up completely so that nobody even recognizes a social emergency, the social emergency of segregation during, during the Depression in particular. So Cullen, McKay, Hughes, and Brooks, Brooks is later, Hughes is a little later, and Cullen, McKay are founders. They are really strategically using traditional form in order to do modernistic things. That's a very long answer to the question, but I, a lot of um, new Modpo people are listening to this webcast and I'm watching and I'm really pleased that you asked the question. So we could say, this is not a step back, this is a pause. This is a way for people to reflect on, for instance, extreme modernism, which nobody could understand. And so Claude McKay was eager to get people to understand something, but he uses his radical content to subvert traditional form. Anyway, Amaris and Dave, any thoughts on where this is six years later? Amaris? Yeah, um, I guess I have to echo what you said about the communist poets that they're in, in their attempt to connect with the mainstream audience undermine their own message by adopting a traditional form. But the Harlem Renaissance poems, um, poets in contrast, and um, I was thinking about County Collins incident and yet do I marvel in particular um, there by adopting respectively this um, ballad and sonnet forms, he's proving to a wider and white audience that he can use traditionally white poet, poetic forms to great power and effect. Um, so there, it's a strategy to demonstrate that he's equally educated and talented and deserving of a place in the canon. Um, and I think by employing vernacular in those poems, he is still remaining true to his voice and creating a new place for up and coming black poets during the Harlem Renaissance. So well said and so understated and brilliant as usual, thank you. Dave Poplar, your thoughts on uh, week five? It's a big, wide range and complicated, right? Right, yeah, and one of the things that we've said uh, before is that a lot of these poems aren't about poetry, not to the same extent that the other poems that we've read are, but they, they really, really are. They are using this insider form for this outsider poetry. And the thing I like about the way they do that is they're taking what is essentially a secret language to them and using it against these insiders. And by doing that, mm -hmm. they're, they're taking away their power over them and, and, and just through the form, just through the use of the form. So even though these do have a message, at the same time, it's about poetry and about 
taking back their power in the way yeah, they Yeah, that's so power. well put, Dave. Thank you. I mean, the, my favorite poem this week, and it's a meta poem, is Gwendolyn Brooks' Boy Breaking Glass, in which she see what some people would call vandalism. And there are people in the forums who say, I don't get it. This is a, this is a poem that's valorizing a, a young person throwing a rock at, a gla at glass. Uh, and uh, it is a uh, progressive liberal slash radical gesture on the part of Gwendolyn Brooks to say that this is art, this is expression, and the poem does honor to that expression of that quote unquote boy by breaking it breaking itself apart. I mean, Gabe, can you read the last couple of lines of mm -hmm. Boy Breaking Glass? I have it. You have it? I mean, wow, talk about, so this is an engagement of the Steinian for the purpose of showing the fragmentation that's possible when you honor this young man who's not presumably, who's, who's sort of an outsider poet, an outsider artist, who's presumably not steeped in Gertrude Stein. So you get this breaking up of the poem. Can you read the last stanza? Mm-hmm. Who has not Congress, lobster, love, luau, the Regency Room, the Statue of Liberty runs, a sloppy amalgamation, a mistake, a cliff, a hymn, a snare, and an exceeding sun? Wow. I mean, that sounds like Let Us Describe, in a way. It sounds yeah. like the end of Let Us Describe. Um, that's a meta poem, as Dave says, because it's a model seeing this young person do the vandalism, and then Brooks, who's fairly old or senior or established when she sees that, it's at the 1960s, saying, I'm taking my cue. This is where I'm learning the importance of modernistic fragmentation. Yeah? You like, you like that poem. Yeah, I do. This is a really complicated poem for me that I actually feel sometimes like the other TAs are more ahead of me on. I, I like have trouble really like, when I get to that paragraph, I almost feel like um, I have no idea what's going on, which is great. I like to be there. Um, but right when I see Luau is when I'm like signaled away from any kind like, of sense of being like, from? oh, I know where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is good. I think it's this way in which it totally just, you know, opens its hands and unravels at the end. Yeah. Um, because there is a real like fixed narrative, I think, going into that stanza. Yeah. You know, there's the the breaking of the glass, the boy, she identifies that as a kind of making. There's these quotes from seemingly the boy. But then when you get to there, it's like this um, this pile of images and that, that I really don't have much of a reference that might not, or they might, um, and we can't really decide between those. Yeah, okay, well said. Mandana, are you still there? Yes, sir. What do you think? Uh, I love what you're all saying, and you really, uh, I think you understood that I was, and I should have said it, but I was talking about the Harlem Renaissance more than anything else. Right. Um, it seems to me that Stein dismantled form, but the, the folks in the Harlem Renaissance, maybe not, not uh, purposely thinking this way, they did something in a way far more difficult. They decided to use form, recreate form as a Trojan horse. Uh, to kind of get into enemy lines. It's, this is a horrible analogy, but it's kind of like those old Bugs Bunny movies that were made for children, but there were coded levels of understanding of a lot of other things that were coming through, but in a form that many people could take in without realizing the deeper implications of it. And that to me is pretty damn radical, let alone the music of it. Yes, so well said. Thank you, Mandana. It was great to hear your Thank voice. You. Thanks for Have doing your meetup on Saturday, and we'll talk it's soon. It'll be fun. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. 484-352-2429. Lily and Jason, mm -hmm. thoughts on any of this? I mean, we have to remember, I think, that when we say form, we don't mean traditional stanza form. Mm -hmm. Non-traditional poems have a form. There's a diction. There's a tone. There's word choice, right? So the relationship between form and content is not somehow... Well, the relationship between form and content is what makes poetry poetry. You know, when you read a newspaper story, you're looking for content. You basically, the form is somewhat transparent. It's sort of right margin justified, you know. Poetry is so fun because poets make formal choices all the time, and there is a potential radicalism in form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think, like, I don't necessarily fully share the enthusiasm for some of the course of like 
breaking off communication is the ultimate goal and form should be extremely radical always. Um, I love a, I love story. I think storytelling and creating a scene or a narrative is like a really powerful tool, especially for anyone who's like not a straight white man. So I think like uh, I like this week because it brings some more of those perspectives into play where like we like to me what's radical about can be radical about the form of a poem is just choosing to frame it as a poem um but not necessarily like uh you know like just moving a story or an idea into the world of a poem where we're going to be paying attention to all elements of it um like how it's told and the rhythm of it and everything as opposed to just in a short story where we wouldn't pay attention to those things um so yeah, I don't like, I'm not super always down for like extremely complicated poetic forms. Like I like, I'm interested in Stein, but I'm always happy when we move to this mm -hmm. part of the course. And this part of the course has uh, influences that have not been well tracked by literary criticism or by the mm -hmm. canon, such as the importance of this kind of storytelling to, for instance, the New York poets or even the beat poets, because mm -hmm. There's a return to, there's a, there's a kind of uh, telling it all quality to some of the Frank O'Hara poems, for instance. Um, and certainly uh, black arts poetry in the mid 60s, Baraka, as a sort of a great example, is influenced by the Harlem Renaissance, returns to story. He also returns to modernist strategies. Mm -hmm. So the full integration of the tw of 20th century poetry has to wait until these storytellers begin to use. This is why it's such an important moment in the course that these writers, I mean, Brooks, the one we just talked about, is a perfect example. So is Dinner Guest Me, yeah. which is telling the story of an evening at dinner with well-intentioned well liberal whites. And it is a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With all of the brilliant strategies that poets who learned modernism get to use. Uh, Jason, your thoughts on yeah. any of this? Um, well, I think um, one thing to consider is that all the things that the objects that we're looking at are, we're, we're calling them poems. And um, they, so the, the first formal move that they make is to uh, take the, the form of a poem. And um, so at particular moments, it matters. I, I don't, th like, I think um, calling it a step backwards, like a D, like a, like a. I don't think Mandana meant to call it that. No, no. Well, what, what I mean is, is the, like what what can be called like basically to be a poem it's something made out of language that depends in part on the interaction between form and content mm -hmm. to uh like the the form by being by by being designated a poem, our attention to form should be immediately heightened, and, yes. and more attention should be paid to it. I mean, in certain ways, some people are introduced to poetry in early education as uh, form being a kind of. Uh, puzzle or derangement of the content that kind of has to be undone to get at right. what the poem means. Right, solved. Right. So, um, but I mean, I think any instance of language is going to be, uh, like there is no language, like the only language outside of form is the absence of language or total silence. So right. we there would have no to look- There is no such thing as, as semantic meaning without form, obviously. Right, like to- It's a false like, distinction. Right, there, 
there is like the idea like of form of form and content as two separate things is like leftover uh, baggage from the soul that inhabits the form of the body, mm -hmm. um, and that the soul is the pure true thing, and that the body is kind of in the way. Or, I think there's or, an ex uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But but what I think is that. Uh, For the sake of argument, like to think about what it means for the poet to not be like like there's a kind of I mean I would think of Niedeker as someone who does things with form, but one is not. Uh, Kind of looking at the the all conventions of language being shattered, like in the way that a, a Stein poem can be, um, and there is a kind of uh, the like a a form which resists uh, most readers like the resistance to to circulation and uh, almost like something that you can put on a little piece of paper and put it in your pocket like a little like a little prayer or something has its own value mm -hmm. but it's a different uh, value than and it's so, so the kind of open, kind of generous, I, I would say there's a certain generosity to being challenging, and there's a certain generosity to, um, to, to chicken soup. <laughs> I like the, uh, there are a lot of things you said there. One of the things that I really like is this not magical, but transformational moment when you call a piece of writing a poem, mm -hmm. then everyone has to start thinking about the formal properties of it. Mm -hmm. They should have been thinking about it if it's not called mm -hmm. a poem, I think. But we sort of forget because we move through the semanticism of daily life following stop signs mm -hmm. and you know, reading the newspaper for facts and forgetting about all the formal conventions of journalism that are typically obscuring mm -hmm. <laughs> the historical or political truth that's supposed to be said. But when you call it a poem, like a newspaper article, suddenly we're starting to look around for it. And if we haven't swallowed that middle school, high school thing of having to solve puzzles, mm -hmm. we just let the poem work its formalist, formalistic magic on us, we can do lots of things all at the same time. Do we have someone on the phone? I think we're just not ready for you. Get ready. OK. We do, yeah. It's yeah. Eric, uh, first time caller. Eric, you mean Eric Weinstein? No. Eric, just Eric. Different Eric. Okay. Eric Fretz in New York. Eric Fretz. Hi, Eric. Hi, hi. How are I'm you? Okay, are we, I'm, I'm fine. Are we talking, are we live now? Yeah, we're live. This is Al. Okay, I was sorry, there's a delay on the computer. I didn't realize that. Hi. Oh, you know okay, what you should um, do, Eric? You should turn yeah. the computer down and just it's, listen. It's off. It's off. Yeah, great. It's off. It's off. Um, okay, I agreed with what you were saying and you're, you're answering uh, Mandana's question. Although I, have, I have some questions about the such clear distinction between the communist poets on one hand and the Harlem Renaissance on the other. Right. I mean, um, weren't, weren't Claude McKay, I think more in the third period, and Langston Hughes both party members? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so touche, touche, you made a great and, point there. Uh, Claude McKay and, was a and, member of the Jamaican Communist Party, but yes, uh, right. Okay, yeah. But did anyone put this? And and the idea of the of radical content, of the contradiction between radical content and the conservative form, I think needs to also be tempered with an idea that in the third period there was a certain lessening of radical content, even you know within the Communist Party's political line. That's right. Um, so that you have. 
you know, one thinks of a revolutionary moment where there's revolutionary transformation in form and in, in content to go together. But this was a time when they were downplaying the revolution and telling people to vote for Roosevelt and, you yeah. know, shutting down the organization of sharecroppers and all the rest of that. And those, and those two things go together. And you, you see that. And so when you see Boy Breaking Glass later in the 60s, when there's a, a breakup of the form, that's the time in the 60s when the revolution has come into politics, the ideas of revolution have come into politics again, however briefly. Um, and I, I wonder if that has something to do with, with what's happening in, 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 you know, to contrast that with the 30s. Yes. Wow, Eric. Totally, yeah, you're right. totally right. Because, I mean, you're, the, the 30s literary left nerd in me might come out and I have to stop that because I could go on for a half hour about this. But okay. let, me just, let me just say that in part what you're saying is that when you get to the popular front, starting in the summer of 1935 and moving up through the end of the 30s, uh, there's a greater latitudinarianism in the literary left and a lot more tolerance of modernistic trends. Uh, prior to that, in the early 30s, from 32 to 34, there was a lot of party insistence that you use things like sonnets and ballads because the people won't understand Williams or Stein or Stevens or Eliot and those people Eliot was called a fascist and you know modernism was decried as not for the people when you when it loosens up in the mid 30s there's an explosion of various kinds of strategies by poets and then there's also the question of whether the poets actually abided by what the commissar cultural commissars were telling them to do and that's an individual case-by-case right. case situation. And you, you were right to draw an analogy to the 60s when a certain amount of dogmatism uh, was an issue. So we, in, when we were in London, we talked about a poet who, who thinks of himself kind of as a street poet named Sean Bonney. We, we did a poem talk about it, and I met with some people who know Sean Bonney well. And Sean Bonney, during the student protests, when... Uh, when uh, the British government was forcing students to pay more, greater tuition in 2010 and 11, kind of a, like a post-neo-Thatcherite moment, um, the students protested and Sean Bonney was invited to speak, to read his poems. And he felt like all the student poets were being very dogmatic and writing only slogans. And so he had the same dilemma that they had in the 30s that Ruth Lechlittner and Genevieve Taggart had in the 30s of like, I don't want to just do slogans. I want to do poetry that I think of as interesting. And this is a perennial question. It just ne So Lechlittner and Taggart are wrestling with these problems. And I think we need, you're right, we need to give them credit for how nuanced this difficulty is. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense as a response? Eric? I think we might have lost Eric. I thought it made sense as a response. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, Gabe. <laughs> Eric, thank you for the call. If, you, if you're able to call back, we would love to get a response. But does anybody want to... I mean, Lily was nodding when he was talking. So, you know, Lech Littner's lines. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that for a second? And then maybe we'll turn to uh, Amaris on that one. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's hard... Uh, it's hard to talk about at this current moment in the United States where a lot of, well, you know, whatever, a lot of really terrible things are happening for, I don't want to just say women, people who can get pregnant um, in terms of, like, access to abortion and should birth control be covered by a state who wants to decide whether or not it's, like, okay for people to have sex just for pleasure. Um, you know, these are, like, issues that are very palpable and very real so like still to this day so we've as a culture and as like a an art community like not figured out how to talk about this still yet like in a way that convinces people who don't have to deal with this problem on a like literal bodily level um to care about it or that it's like worth their time or interest so um, Choosing this subject matter was a pretty radical move on her part yeah. in 1936. <clears throat> right, yeah, definitely radical choice of subject matter. Also just like, uh, you know, not, not something that... It's not like she made 
a choice and then later we're coming from a more smug point of view of like, well, now we would make a different choice because we know how to talk about it now. It's like, we for sure don't. <laughs> we, this may end up, maybe this is the best right strategy because we don't have a good strategy right now mm. to talk about it because there are, there's like huge rooms full of old white men who are saying like, why should we have to pay for this thing when we don't use it? As if that's like how it works. <laughs> Maybe they just need to read this poem. I don't know. <laughs> so, Amaris, um, one of the several things that Lily just said is that we still don't have strategies for how to write, describe, or talk about this. Um, Lech Littner is using a strategy. Isn't it, Eric was saying, isn't it similar to the work of the Harlem Renaissance poets with the same kinds of limitations? What do you think? I'm sorry. Uh my connection is really in and out, and I couldn't hear what Lily was saying. Okay. Well, um, I mean, what, what, one of the things that Lily said is that we still don't have, this is an ongoing question, and we still don't have strategies for dealing so, with such topics. Um, and, you know, this is, a, this is a, I think, a gesture of reclaiming what Lechlitner, the dilemma that she's facing, and, and giving it more value, perhaps, than, than is simply implied by the well, radical content, traditional form, failure, criticism, mm -hmm. which is not anything that anybody really has said, but it's kind of a shorthand for that kind of doubt. Anyway, Amaris, what do you think? Uh, um, no, I lost her. I think we lost her, okay. All right. Jason, you yeah, have a thought on this? Yeah. Um, well, we can also think of, uh, just to go back to, something I was saying before, that um, like uh, Ruth Le Leitner could have written an opinion article for a newspaper, right? Uh, she may have also done that, but she's choosing uh, to work in this mode, which itself carries its own host of connotations and the, the history of what, you know, of like poetry's history from Homer to Dante on. Um, not, not only, like it's, I think that the, what, what I want to talk about for a second is just thinking about another aspect of ways that a poem makes meaning, or, or any text, but a poem in particular, in which um, we are in a, which Modpo makes so uh, available and palpable, is the, the sum of collected, like the sum of different audiences that one can kind of imagine also reading the poem. Mm -hmm. So you are in like, like we think of the poem as this intimate encounter between the text, like the right, the words and the reader, but a, like these are not poems that were sent as handwritten letters to one particular addressee they are like tossed into the world yeah. for uh, where strangers may encounter them. And uh, like there's, we can think about part of the, the formal implications of the poem as gesturing at different circles of potential audiences mm -hmm. and their of the, their kind of, we can think about other readers encountering Gertrude Stein. We can think about, like, what does, like, I've always struggled with Langston Hughes and not really understood why he was published um, because I don't find the poems to generate internal friction between form and content, which is what I find so delicious about poetry. Um, 
because it's such an unpredictable like uh, collision of of effects. And can, can we get back to Hughes in a sec? Yeah, yeah. I want to pick up one point that you made and turn it to Joe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, so Jason said, well, you know, Ruth Lechner, feeling as strong as strongly as she does, could have written an op-ed piece, an editorial, mm -hmm. I think he said. And then her pro-choice position, which wouldn't have been called that in the 1930s, uh, would have been very, very clear, unmistakably clear. Mm -hmm. And the form of the op-ed would not have been foremost in our minds. What would have been foremost in our minds is the arguments she brought to bear in prose. But Joe, she wrote a poem, and in mod, the Mod Po forums, I won't go to them for this, but in the Mod Po forums, there are people who say, I really don't know what her position on abortion is. Mm -hmm. Now that's partly because she used satire and irony, and it's possible, although I don't think that's, uh, what, what can I say? I don't think that's a fruitful interpretation mm -hmm. <laughs> of this poem, but it's possible to say, I don't know her position. So, Joe, that's the risk we take when we use poetic strategies, right, as opposed to op-ed. So what do, we, what do we gain, in short, by not doing op-ed, but by doing this? Well, uh, ideally, the poem will end up being uh, far more memorable um, than an op-ed piece. I mean, just the by nature of show. poetry lends itself to, to memory, to, to mimetic, you know, reception. So... The, and the fact that the poem isn't grounded in one, you can't, I can't parse out either whether she's pro-choice or, or not, but um, it keeps the question open and it keeps a dialogue going. And mm -hmm. um, it's such a stark poem and, so, and really do, truly radical for its time. So, and we're talking about it now. So that's, we wouldn't be talking about it now if it were an op-ed. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely the case. Anna, we have someone on the phone? Yes, we do. This is Allison, a four-time mod power, but first-time caller calling from Canada. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Hi, Allison. Hi, Al. How are you? I'm it's great. It's Allison calling from near Toronto. Great. Uh, I'm actually not a first-time caller. We've spoken on the phone before. Okay. Uh, but first time this year. Fantastic. How are you doing? We're Sorry, great. Allison. You know, uh, we shouldn't say this, but... When we got back from London, we thought, okay, where are we going to go next October? And there are two options. So I guess Modpo people out there can vote on this with their, your tweets or something. Um, one option was Toronto. The other option, which I think the team kind of likes better because it's more exotic traveling, would be one stop in Edinburgh, one stop in Dublin. I take it you would vote for Toronto. Well, I think um, not too familiar with Edinburgh, but uh, I think Dublin's had more than their fair share of poetic inspiration, and I think we could really use you up here a little bit more. Wow, uh, Allison, so that's so In the interest sassy. of international relations, I'd say, hey, it's a pretty good time, but don't you dare do to me what Conan did, because when he had his show in Toronto, I could not get the tickets, and I've never forgiven him. Mm -hmm. So if you're coming to Toronto, I want to make sure I get a front row seat. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Allison, you're... That's hilarious. I, <laughs> Conan is on my <laughs> shit list, too, but for different reasons. Um, wow. Okay. Well, we, maybe we should do both. I'm not sure, but, yeah. You could do both. It's not that far. We're in the same time zone, too, so that might create some form of convenience, I don't know, on a technical level. You know me. I'm not very good at the technical aspects, but uh, <laughs> uh, currently I'm on the phone because I'm not able to work the forums, and Facebook is down. So Facebook is uh, down. That Long live Facebook. Death to Facebook. That's amazing. <laughs> always cutting out during mob po time this happens a lot it's clearly a conspiracy a against poetry i mean facebook I poetry I really facebook poetry I'm not so. sure you shouldn't that. say too much in an yeah. international forum uh do you want to dare a question to yes me? we I do so woefully behind in my reading uh i think i did a forum saturday was that last saturday i don't know talking to eric and the group about uh 
um, HD. That was the last I did. I'm trying to get comfortable with not being able to keep up, and I'm yes. still not that comfortable. That's crucial. Let me just say that you should be comfortable with not keeping up and just go right to the current week and plan to catch up later because ModPo's open all year. Yes, and I, and I have to be comfortable with the fact that, that there is a later because uh, there is a I later. feel like all of my life I felt like, oh, this is my last chance to do this. And now with this annual event of ModPo that does continue on in the interim, I yeah. feel like there is a later and yeah. you don't have to. I think that, that's sort of a, an occupational hazard when, when you are a student for, for many years that you feel like life is just built of deadlines and it really isn't. <laughs> Well, well, you're a four-time mod poet. Yeah, you're seriously, you're committed <laughs> to this. By the way, before you ask your question, Allison, Ray Maxwell writes, uh, I need that 280 characters to really get into this, but let's just conclude, quote, we create the tool and the tool creates us. That's in reference to the recent conversation we had. Uh, Jess Jaspers writes, Edinburgh, yes, please. And Jeremy Dixon says, what about October in Cardiff? I don't think so, Jer Jeremy, but you'll come to London if we go back to London. Anyway, Allison, do you have a question or a comment? I really didn't, Al, to be honest. Okay. Um, there's a lot. Have we covered the discussion about the How book yet? Shannon and Shannon Ratliff and I um, uh, read that uh, together over the summer. My Emily Dickinson. Uh, together no, we're not there yet. Part, but. No, okay, we'll, I, I will have some things I, I'd okay. like to ask. All when right, we come to well, that. call back I did in week eight. Yeah, and I did want to remark that, uh, that I do find that content aside, and the content is very important, of course, and, and, uh, and your livelihood, so I don't want to disrespect that, but content aside, I, I do feel that uh, just the very fact that MobPo exists is so inspiring, um, particularly uh, some, some uh, all of the TAs inspire me, but uh, some of them, per, perhaps the younger ones, when I see you getting into your conversations, uh, you know, honestly, it just even makes me wish I'd had kids. I mean, just to see how fantastic you all are. You're all beautiful. Um, Thank you. You all are beautiful in a more mature way, of course. Um, but uh, it's incredibly inspiring to me as someone who's always practiced the arts as an, on an amateur basis. Um, Thank you. And kind of abandoned academia quite early on uh, in favor of a life of uh, sloth alternating with drudgery. Uh, <laughs> it means a lot to me that... Um, for example, I've, uh, you know, motivated myself to actually take up painting uh, again this past week That's uh, great. that I've had on a shelf for quite That's a good great. one who, who does paintings more That's uh, great. recently. Allison? And, you know, you just really inspire me. So I'm so glad. Much. Thank you for telling us that. That makes our day. We really appreciate your call. Well, thanks. Maybe you'll call back during week eight. We'll talk about my Emily Dickinson and have a great day. I'm taking note. Week eight. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, 484 352 2429. Gabe, uh, you know, Eric really got us on our quick dismissal of the communist poet strategy. This is somewhat similar to what McKay and Cullen are doing in particular. Yeah? Yeah, I was thinking during that call about a lot of things. Um, one is like recently I've been like doing a little bit of reading around in the 1930s actually of like a lot of experimental fiction in the 1930s, especially from like gay authors. And one intersection that I was thinking about is Bruce Nugent um, of the Harlem Renaissance who wrote uh, a lot of really experimental fiction. And the one thing I was thinking during Eric's call is that I think Eric gave us a nice political context for us to think about in doing this. And he talks about, kind of like a conservativizing of the Communist Party's message, which would lead to um, a way in which the communist poets would tackle their subject matter in perhaps a more stylistically conservative way. Mm -hmm. But what I don't want us to do is think of the 1930s only as a period of moving towards conservatism because there is a lot of really formally, formally experimental writing yeah, from that course. pyramid of period. Course. like. You know, like The Young and the Evil, the book that Gertrude Stein loved, which is yeah. a crazy underread text, or many of the Harlem Renaissance writers. But yeah. we deal with 
this kind of narrative yeah. in a useful way, which is to say that there are political things happening, which we obviously don't have the time to really contextualize. Right. But let me just say, this mm -hmm. is a great moment to pitch ModPo Plus. Yes. Because right. ModPo Plus generally is a complication of the simplistic literary history that ModPo's main syllabus gives us. This is true. So, for instance, the chapter three, which is just two poems by these two women, Lech, Lechner, and Taggart, mm -hmm. well, there's so much else, including formerly experimental poetry, yeah. uh, less communistic, uh, less dogmatic uh, in terms of uh, topics. So, and chapter four, it's probably the largest, this would be Harlem Renaissance and its, yeah. its influences. That's the largest ModPo Plus segment mm. that we have. And there's so much more there. So, I mean, yeah. we urge everybody to go to ModPo Plus because we sort of force ourselves into simplistic generalizations be for, the, for the sake of having like, this is, we are covering communist poetry, Harlem Renaissance poetry, Frost, and the neo-formalists, whom we haven't talked about today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten poems for like 30 years. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it is ridiculous. This mm -hmm. is not, we don't mean that, people. We just wanted to create something that people could do in eight or nine hours during the week. And we were even told when we created Mopo, that's too much. Break it down into 15-minute chunks. And literary history is much too complicated. For yeah, that. yeah. One plug so. from the Modpo Plus this week is "Green Light" by Kenneth Fearing. Right? Kenneth Fearing. That's it's a great poem. example. Yeah. Uh, uh, for chapter three. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is a that's an amazing that's an amazing poem. Okay, we have someone on the phone. We do. We have an old pal Jim calling who would like to respond particularly to something that Jason was saying. Is that going to go about form? Okay, great. So Jason, and by the way, Jason's comments have gotten ton, tons of praise in. The subforum, Eleanor Smagarinsky from Australia, for one thing, um, and also, um, and also, Joy thinks you're talking too close to the mic. By the way, which is thanks, Joy. <laughs> uh, and Eric F uh, wrote to say that he just lost the line on the phone call. He didn't, you know, hang up on us or whatever. <laughs> but uh, so, th th thanks, Eric. And that was a great question. And Gabe already responded to Eric. Okay, so we have Jim. Hi, yes, Jim. From, from Red Bank. Oh, this is Jim Baumgartner, is that right? Picarello, Picarello. Oh, sorry, Picker. that's right. That's you, and we met you last I'll year. There, I'll be there next week. Great, can't wait. Do you have a question or comment about this week? And then I want to turn to uh, Dave, Amaris, and Joe for their responses. Yeah, well, it's a comment to something that um, uh, Jason said about sort of a form, um, content being like the ghost in the machine of form. And I, I would push back against that and say that, you know, we, we have a height and weight, but we're not made up of uh, some substance called height and some substance called weight. There, there are distinctions you can make when you look at something. And I tend to think of form as how the poet does what the poet does to get something into my head. And then what happens in my head or my senses or wherever it, wherever the poem happens is what the content is. It's not so much something that the poet puts in, but something that you know, sort of collaborate with the poem to sort of get out of the poem. And I think form is sort of how different, different structures relate to other structures. Yeah. I mean, a, a sonnet isn't just 14 lines with a rhyme scheme. It's got a whole tradition that, uh, that defines what that form is. Yeah. That's so well put. Jim, would you stay on the phone for just a second? And sure. um, so, we'll, uh, Joe, did, were you able to hear Jim's comments? Joe yeah, Masson? I heard it. I heard it yeah, clearly. do you want to you have a response? You know, I could talk uh, in circles for hours about form and content, and it all starts to kind of blur together. And I think that's because form and content are completely reliant on each other. You can't have one without the other. It's like beheading a Siamese twin, you know, you still, you, you, you'll, you'll kill the whole thing. I mean, the poem needs both to, to, to function, to be. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, Dave, you're, did you hear Jim's comment? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, I thought it was, uh, it was, it was interesting and I, and I agree with that interpretation, but it also makes me think about, you know, just like Joe said, that they're so intertwined. I mean, that's one way of looking at form, but there's other ways of looking at form purely in the sense of content. And it, it is, it is ultimately circular because they're so intertwined. Yes. 
great. Dave, Dave was a, yeah, Dave Jim. Was a philo- Dave was, I think, was a philosophy major, right? He is a the, doctoral student yeah. in philosophy currently. Right. Okay. Yes. This is straight out of the blue book, Wittgenstein's blue book, the notion of property. Whoa, of Wittgenstein makes it to Mopo. Distinctions. Say it again. I was Pardon? just praising you. Sorry. Oh, okay. it, I'm, I'm having, having a hard time hearing. Yeah, I apologize. I interrupted. You were mentioning Wittgenstein. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I just, just in, with reference to Dave, I mean, that's where I got it from, like right out of the blue book. Yeah. Great source. Amaris, did you hear the discussion so far? What do you think? Yeah, um, well, I have to agree. Um, I think that they're intertwined, but that form can have a um, has the potential to enhance the content and to further its message um, in a way that really works. For example, in County Collins incident, you know, a caller is talking about how it can sort of penetrate your brain a little more, and I think that rhyme scheme um, kind of puts you at odds with how. Um, difficult that message and that story is. Um, Or, for example, you know, Claude McKay's If We Must Die, um, him using the sonnet form to respond to um, lynchings of Black men was putting Black characters in a form that they'd never been in before um, and using that as a rallying cry. so I think in both those places, form was used, deployed really effectively to strengthen and enhance the message of those poems. Yeah, and it's a very complicated move. This has been studied by biographers and literary historians of McKay. What a complicated move, because on one hand, he's using a Trojan horse strategy by using the sonnet to, to sneak in to the enemy, really, um, this advocacy of counter-violence as a response to racist violence. But Claude McKay himself would say that on Jamaica, which had uh, a British system of education, he learned the Shakespearean sonnet, and he grabbed that form because that was the most powerful form he knew in order to say what he felt he needed to say. And he didn't ironize it at the choice of that form at all. He was simply doing poetry as he knew it. Um, And I think that there's a lot of um, happy, liberal, uh, critical uh, wishing to use McKay as an example of someone who's conscious, fully conscious of the irony of the choice of the sonnet as merely a subversive act. I think that McKay was doing the subversive act, but he was also using a form he thought would be powerful. Mm -hmm. Like, we can't decide. We cannot decide what the choice of a form means. We just have to really steep ourselves sensitively in literary history to say, here's how one reader might take it. Here's how another reader might take it. Um, and County Cullen using the ballad. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December of all the things that happened there. That's all that I remember. Well, as Joe was saying earlier, that is a strategy for remembering. You can't not remember that stanza because it's a ballad. Mm -hmm. And memory is the point. It's the the, uh, content as well as the form. So brilliant. So Cullen would be the first one to say, I chose the ballad because it would be the thing that people would remember. And my whole point was to try to get people to remember that a racist incident like this happening to an eight-year-old, was he eight? Eight, yeah, is, is traumatic and needs to be remembered. You know, so Jim, are you still there? Yes. Yeah, final thought on all this? Great questions, great um, comments. I'm playing hooky from a meeting, but uh, oh, yeah, it's great, great being, great Wait. being back to my poll again. Tell us about the meeting. Is this is like some really important business meeting. Not really. Okay. <laughs> so it's wait a, a minute. You a, you do a business meeting is and really important. kind of redundant. That's uh, uh, more so you do road. you do uh, you do work life balance really well. It sounds like. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah. Final well, I'm I'm is, I'm so glad you've been involved. Be, don't miss. Well, come on, don't miss Jason's Frank O'Hara in Slopo. 
Yeah, yeah you know, you're right. oh, ballyhooing. Yes, yeah, so you were part of Jason's mini course in Slopo, which Slopo means non. You know, anytime after November, mm -hmm. we go into Slopo. Thank you for ballyhooing that, Jim. Yes, and thanks for I'll being see part. See you next week. Yep. Yeah. See you next week. That's great. Right. Thanks, Bye. Jim. Uh, that's really great. We're going to take one more call if it comes four eight four three five two two four two nine. Um, what we, I, what I'd like to do is go around and include Anna in this. Go around and just get, and Laura, if you want to do this too, you can get the portable mic. Just uh, pick a poem, uh, especially one that we might not have talked about, but one we've talked about too, and just pick a poem and cheerlead for it. Uh, try to encourage people to read it or reread it. I'll list the poems, and you guys can talk about them. I know Dave's going to talk about Death of a Toad. No? Oh, no. I know the one you like we banished to Mod Pope Plus. That was um, the uh, Sylvia Plath poem, yeah. It's Compli Cottage Street, yeah. Complicated. All right. So uh, we have Ruth Lechblitner's uh, Lines for an Abortionist Office, Genevieve Taggart's Interior, County Cullen, Yet Do I Marvel, and also County Cullen Incident, Claude McKay, If We Must Die, Langston Hughes' Dinner Guest, Me, Gwendolyn Brooks' Boy Breaking Glass, Gwendolyn Book's Truth, which we didn't talk about today. Frost's Mending Wall, which we usually talk about half the time and didn't today. Uh, Richard Wilbur, Death of a Toad, and uh, X.J. Kennedy, Nude, Descending a Staircase. So, Amaris, quickly, name a poem and, and very briefly tell us why, you know, why we should care about it. Yeah, sure. Um, I love that we added Boy Breaking Glass to the syllabus because I really feel the frustration in that poem of um, someone maybe trying to get out of the circumstances in which they were born, but running up against the system. And she has so many images of um, really like white privilege of those who, um, all, the rights that all Americans should have. But um, I really see that sort of Dubois double consciousness in this poem between being black and being American and being denied certain um, privileges and luxuries, you know, the, the lobster love, luau, room to room, Statue of Liberty that she says at the end. And I love that she ends on an image of hope. Yeah, So that's so well put. Yeah, my favorite poem of the week. Gabe, uh, Ballyhoo a poem? It can be the same one if you want. Uh, no, I'm not going to do the same one. I was thinking of doing another, but I just remembered that like, I kind of have to take you to task, Jason, for saying that you don't like Langston Hughes at all. I, I want to... I like uh, Ask Your Mama. Okay. Um, I would He's so honest. I would recommend going back to Hughes um, and like getting out of the, uh, like, uh, of Hughes' work, getting out of the, like, two that get talked about, because the other one is Harlem, uh, which is a great poem. But so I would cheerlead Langston Hughes, Didn't Guess Me, as a revisit, um, and then leave uh, hate mail in the forum for Jason Zuzka. Oh, <laughs> please do. No, I mean, you know, I'll wow. I'll into poems. Okay. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, Jason just, he's just... He's got so many credits in the Mod Pope Bank that if he doesn't like Hughes, it's, you know, we'll deal with it. I don't, I don't, I, like, uh, you don't have to defend yourself. My like or dislike is meaningless. Okay. Thank like, you for putting it that way. Yeah, it's, it doesn't mean anything. Okay. It, it means, like, I, uh, I, to dislike something is uh, my own failure. Well, I think in Hughes's case, that's probably true. But you know, I think lots of us shared I'm that gonna failure. I'm going to talk about the Hughes poem. Okay, good. Oh, cool. All right, let's go to Lily and then Joe. Uh, yeah, I like "Truth" by Gwendolyn Brooks, yeah. and I think um, I like that it. Um, when you see a poem called "Truth," and you also you see a metaphor about the sun, you think you're you would sort of think to expect one thing, like. I just really love how it subverts expectation at a content level um, in a way that's really hard to grapple with by just making these really familiar concepts super unfamiliar and confusing. Um, you know, like the way in literature that the sun coming out works is like it's just universally like the symbol of like progress and like you're given another day and that's a blessing, but like what happens if you're not prepared for that? Um, how can we, what are some tools that we can use from the poem to like conceptualize that moment. So I, I really like it for that reason. And it's it's truth, no capital, mm -hmm. which is just like mm -hmm. so Brooks. 
Like, because you don't have, you can capitalize truth for a poem title because that's what you do with poem title. Yeah. But she really is serious. This is not the big truth. Yeah, this it's is, something hidden under, not yeah. hidden, but it's the, like the real soul of truth. Yeah, that's, that's a j- hidden gem because our discussion of that, first of all, is too long for most people to listen to. It's like 60 minutes. And second, it's only audio. <coughs> mm-hmm. So I w- that's a, such a great plug, Lily, yeah. because I think we, more people need to get to that discussion in that poem. It's, it's really good. Yeah. Uh, before we turn to Jason, who's going to do a Hughes, I'll just catch you up on some of, of the t- tweets. Um, uh, Sheila is very happy that Jim is playing hooky from a meeting. You got good priorities, she says. Uh, Eric reminds us, Eric Weinstein reminds us that on um, the evening of October 25th, there'll be a Phil- Philadelphia Mod Po meetup here at the Writer's House prior to the webcast. Uh, Kathy D says, so form can be used by content just as content can be shaped by form. Hashtag Modpo Life. Joy apologizes. Forgive me, Jason. Blame my oversensitive hearing. Um, and there's a That's lot okay. other. Uh, Jeremy Dixon says, don't worry, I don't want kids. <laughs> All right, Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Errol Shields Inc. Uh, says, Scotland needs you. Make it Edinburgh, please. Uh, M. Brennan says, Brenneman says, Denver, we need you in the West. Okay. So there's a lot of votes for Edinburgh. So, and, and Zach and Chris are really happy about that. They really want to do that. So, Jason, a plug a poem. Plug, plug a poem? That sounds like a. Pl- I don't know. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I, and Laura will be next. Yeah, I'm good. All right. I will go privately plug a poem. And then I will. Um, You're uh, making it sound obscene. I, don't... I know. Um, okay, so anyway. <laughs> oh, you knew what that. I would, okay. re- what I would plug. It's such an. Uh, that's a, I can't get past Jason, that just word. Ta- All okay, right. Don't so the, plug a poem. The Valley thing one. Is, is that uh, Langston Hughes wrote. An enorm- I, I carry. I, I always have accessible his collected works, and I always dip into it. Wait, He's like apologized. in the way that I don't like toma- raw tomatoes, but I always try them like twice a year. Hey, I always Jason, dip into Langston Hughes. Pick a poem in arc syllabus that you like. I am <laughs> really interested. Look in- at Amory. She just finds this so funny. Okay, I would. You tell- should be here dealing with him. I'll come in. I'll come to. Y- I'll come sit next to you next week. Oh, that would be cool. She's a long way away, though. I need a break. <laughs> um, but uh, what I would suggest to our, our listeners is, um, g- however you can access the poem Ask Your Mama, which is a, uh, Hughes's experimental poem that experiments with voice and marginalia. Um, but I would also, I think it's really interesting to, to compare dinner guest me and truth in, in terms of the pronouns that are used. Yes. Okay. Dinner guest kind me. Kind of an unfair comparison, but yes. Well, well, I know I am is the first line of dinner guest me. And, and if the sun comes, how shall we greet him? So I also think that the actual point that I'm making um, which I'm not sure that I'm making, but the point is, is that to think about other uh, traditions of uh, poetry, and even to think of like collective speech, and in a way, like what does it mean to use to 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 pick? The, I mean, it's a formal decision and a content decision. What is the what is how do you classify the selection of a pronoun? Whether you pick we or I. But yes. they have totally different effects. Yes. And we like creates a uh, chorus effect. Like it's it creates uh, if you listen to it right, like you can hear the whole everyone in the building speaking together. Jason managed to, to uh, uh, recommend three poems. One not on the snap snaps for Jason. Uh, I'm the only one snapping. Um, uh, Joe, did you do a po- did you do one yet? Can you do it quickly? Yeah, very quickly. Uh, I I'm my favorite poem this week is Gwendolyn Brooks' "Truth." Um, I know I'm not the only one. Um, 
I love all the questions. The qu I, questions in poems are interesting to me because in how it interrogates the reader, it kind of creates an interesting reading experience. And then the lines to sleep in the coolness of snug unawareness. I just think that's so terrific. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Dave Poplar, do you have a favorite this week? Uh, yeah, I just uh, want to give another shout out to Boy Breaking Glass. And one, one stanza in particular, the second stanza, I shall create, if not a note, a whole, if not an overture, a desecration. That's and great. I, I love that whole idea. It's playing wow. with negative space. It, it reminds me of a guitar teacher I once had who told me, for solos, it's not the notes you play, but it's also the notes you don't play. Right. But in this context, I really like it because it, it, it totally plays with the idea of being an outsider um, and you know, using that, that negative space. Yeah, very well said. Laura, hi, Laura. Thank you so much for coming today. Oh, it's a pleasure. And I am a strong advocate for Gwendolyn Brooks Truth. And I'm pleased to know that so many others yeah. here felt the same way. And yep. Joe Massey picked the precise lines I, I also wanted to draw attention to. And just um, find that poem better and better with each rereading. That's great. Thank you so much. Anna, you want to pick a poem? Uh, can I punt to the phone call? Yeah, you can. Okay. We're going to take our last phone call. By the way, before Alana says, Jason is so funny. And Kathy D, hi. <laughs> Who is this? This is Lou. Lou Ling in Madison. Hi, Lou. Can you hold on one sec? I'm just summarizing some tweets. Uh, sure. Uh, Kathy D says, Jason is, and then there's a bunch of icons. Is that what we call those? <laughs> Emojis. Jason is so inexplicable emojis today. Uh, Lady Fairfax says, Edinburgh and, and Dublin, yes. And Kim Manley Ort says, please Hello. come to Toronto. Hi, Lou. How are you? Hi there. Great. This is Al. Sure. How's Modpo for you? Is it good? Lou, are you there? I am. Oh, great. How's Modpo for you? Good? My Paul is wonderful. This is my second time through, and great. I enjoy it very, very much. Great. We're, we're running out of time, Listen, but we'd I, love to I, hear... I wanted to, to say, I, no one calls you doctor. I'd like to call you Dr. You know, Farias. Uh, don't call me Dr. Farias, <laughs> but you can call me Dr. Phil Reese. But I really like I, Al. I can't pronounce your name. No, okay, that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> Lou, that's fine. Listen, my, my high school mates called me Phil Grits. Wow. <laughs> okay. And well, then they called me Phil. And I get all kinds of things. So. Yeah. I don't mind being called doctor. The problem is that when somebody has a stroke or something, they call on me, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, I, we, used to, we used to say I'm a real doctor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right, right. Anyway, I'm glad things are going well. And Modpo, do you have a, a question? We're just about to wrap up. We'd love a question. Uh, well, I guess a simple question is, no one has mentioned that in the Licklider poem, the very end, thrust the, uh, the cure at home. Yes. That's, Thru that's also from a Shakespeare, thrust home. And that was, was that Brutus and Caesar, or it was, uh, will yeah, somebody I Google that, that line it was taken from Shakespeare. All right, we're, Google we're Googling that. But so far you're telling us the only, yeah, I guess it could be it could be a, an A2 Brutus moment. It's possible. At, you know, thrust home was was is a line from Shakespeare. Yeah, she and doesn't then, use then the, then the she doesn't use thrust up. home, Lou. Though, just thrust deep. Well, all right. Yeah. she's she's paraphrasing it. No, but I, I think no, I think you're right. I think there's something Shakespearean here. Did you come up with something? I find yeah, it, but there's certainly a at least a kind of like. Um, vengeful murder. Like there's yeah. a way in which it's depicted yeah. as a real killing. I mean, yes. like a, I not, just wanted to say the whole Lecklider poem is is all formed just about, and it yes. has one message, and it presents that message with tremendous clarity. Yes, I'm a gynecologist, and I've had to face this very problem my whole life. Yeah, and uh, so this poem is especially. Uh, uh, pertinent to me, and the form of it is, of course, the churchness, the uh, yes. the these and the thous from King James Bible. Yes. Uh, there's just so much that in the form of this that yes. goes to produce the message. Lou, can I ask you a couple of questions, and you can decline to answer if you want. You may. Okay, how old are you? I am 81 years old. Hey, okay, so you you were a practicing MD at the time when abortion was illegal. 
Sir, I've had policemen watch me do a DNC on an abortion so they could arrest the mother after I was done. So, so this, this, this poem, you're a special reader of this poem, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, and so I'm so glad that you, because there is some ambiguity that some people in the forums, some people in the forums think she's not clear about what her position is, but you, you think she's very clear. I, I can't imagine anybody not, not seeing that she, that this is a plea for uh, women who, who need to have an abortion to be able to have that abortion. May I, may I just, th this will be a little obvious, uh, Lou, but while you're on the phone, let's do it. Um, sh close here thine eyes, O state. She's saying, don't look because the state outlaws this. These are thy guests who bring with, to gods with appetites grown great a votive offering. Know that they dare defy the words of law and priest. Better to let the unborn die than starve while others feast. Let's focus for a second on the politics and the argument, the pro-choice argument. Better to let the unborn die than starve while others feast. That means, I take it, um, people who, like the church and the state at that time, who oppose the right of a woman to abort a fetus, an unwanted pregnancy, um, would rather have... Uh, would rather have women starve who cannot afford to take care of a child, right? That's an argument that was used for many, many years. Yes, that is. Mm -hmm. That's familiar to you, right? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Well, th Lou, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Not do Sorry. Are you there? Yes, we are. Uh, and it's been a, a terrible dilemma in my life. I've had friends who desperately needed to have that done, but I couldn't do it. And the reason is uh, that I do believe that once conception occurs, it... Oh, I think we lost Lou. ...not Lou? smart enough okay. to interfere with that. And it's, uh, yeah. it's been a terrible dilemma in my life, and it doesn't yeah. make sense. Yes. Lou, thank you so much for the call. I'm glad we got your call in, and uh, I'm glad you're enjoying ModPo. Thanks again, and best of luck to you. Okay, that was Lou, and that was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so we're just going uh, we, to... I, th I think the uh, going around for favorite poems will constitute the final words. We'll, I'll just end with a couple of shout-outs. Um, I just want to point out that there are intense discussions going on about politics and poetry on race, on abortion rights, in the week five poem-specific subforums. So I would urge everybody who's listening to this uh, webcast to go there and check it out. Uh, it's really quite amazing. And finally, I want to shout out to Val Moulton. So those of us who were in London met Val for the first time. She has been involved with ModPo since the beginning. She was a great participant in the meetup we had at Birkbeck University of London. She had come a long way to be with us, and after the meetup, she went with a bunch of us to a pub nearby and hung out with us and hoisted a few, which was great. Um, Val probably wouldn't mind me saying or wouldn't be too mad at me saying that she's elderly, uh, she's been frail. She, when she made her first comment at the meetup, she stood up and said, pretty dramatically, that Maud Poe saved her life. And then she explained that she had been through some very tough times uh, prior to, I think, two years ago, uh, and that Maud Poe was pretty much the only thing that she could do, uh, that she was capable of, and she said it saved her life, which was very moving to all of us. Uh, she got involved in the last slow post season with Joe Massey's mini course on Sid Corman, you remember her, uh, Joe? Do you remember Val Moulton? I do, yes. Yeah. So anyway, she was in this thing, and so this is eight months ago, and she, she perked up again after being out for a while, being AWOL in Joe's uh, mini course. And she wrote, I had hoped to join in, but have been overtaken by events. And these events she told me about when I met her, but I won't describe them. I'm still managing to keep up with reading the threads, and they are all amazing, especially this one, many thanks. And what I really love is what happened next. Dave Bender wrote, Val, good to hear from you. Hope all is well. 
MC Catanis, one of our CTAs, wrote, Hi, Val. I so appreciate what you mean by being overtaken by events. It's so great you stopped by. Love, MC. Joe Massey wrote, Val, great to have you here in any capacity. And Val Moulton wrote, Thanks for the welcome and kind words. I'm fine, and my family is too. It looks as if things are beginning to ease. It's been a great help to drop in here and to read the threads. And this is just a reminder to all of us that there are people around the world, 189 different countries. There are people clustered together in many dozens in places like London. There are groups in Tokyo and Barcelona. We just recently heard about a Barcelona group. Some of them are quiet. They're not in the threads. Some, like Lou, you know, are out there for a couple of years and makes his first call. People resonate with the poems. Uh, it is very heartening to meet, to go all the way across the Atlantic and meet someone like Val and so many others. And I guess it's a reminder to us that this free open course is a gift or is seen by people as a gift. And we are not... I don't think of us as gift givers. I think as I think of us as people who sort of get the gift too. So week six breaks a little wide open to consider the beats. Urge everybody who's interested in week six and who may have been there already before, because we skimmed the surface of a couple of classics, you know, Ginsburg and so forth, uh, to go to Modpo Plus and re and read the week six. One more plug, week five, we are uh, doing peer reviews of each other's papers, essays. So that's um, essay number two on William Carlos Williams. So if you haven't been in the forums, we're, our hope is that everyone who wrote a, an essay will be able to get at least four responses. So Gabe, thank you so much. Thank you. Lily, thank you. Jason, you are apparently a superstar here. Uh, everybody tweets about you and only you. It's Joe Massey, thank you again. Dave Poplar, Amaris Kachansky, Anna Strong Safford, hey buddy. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Still hanging in there after coming back from London. Zach and Chris, everybody snaps for these two doing amazing things. And Laura, thank you for joining us and we will see you a week from today. I don't know what time it is, but we'll announce it. 5.30 p.m. Philadelphia time. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.